I have an official apology. The uh, video did go last night, but the light doesn't turn red anymore. And so all those bad things I said, the distance learning person heard them. And I think I'm on my fifth apology. Um, so I uh, apologize. They did point out that ha having me apologize probably means tonight won't be recorded. But nonetheless, we still have um, the backup videos. So my apologies. Yes? Can I ask a question about Rob's permission from last time? I mean, not from the, the cabinet president last time. So if you have a core which has, say, one large core in the middle and surrounded by a bunch of small core throats, right? So the idea was you were, when you start flooding your core, the large pores get built first. Right. Except that one's in the middle. Except that was in the middle. So what would happen in that case is it would not pour fill up when all the small pores It's the largest pore that's in contact with the face. Right? Sure. It's the largest pore that's in contact with the face. Right. Shake the door so he can get in. Just stand in front of it, Juan. So, yeah. so when you actually analyze the pore size distribution for that, it would look like there were more... I honestly don't know what would happen there. Theoretically, I guess when it hits that particular pore at a certain pressure, it would you'd see a uh, and that's actually how. Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid if I use the pen, something really bad is going to happen. But based on what you're describing, the capillary pressure curve will probably look like this, and then it's going to take a whole bunch, right? And I'm trying to think there won't be any pressure change, so it'll probably do something like horizontal and then go back up. Generally speaking, you don't see that. What you generally see is something that looks like this. Sorry. Damn it. And then as it comes up over here, it switches and does like that. And that's not a very good drawing, but that's thought to be fractures, or it's thought to be the rock fracturing. Whenever you're, whenever you have enough mercury in there, in theory, the uh, rock is in equilibrium because the pressure is the same everywhere, right, around it, but they also think that when you get up into the, these uh, micromoretics mercury injection devices can go to 100,000 psi, which is how many bars? A lot, I guess. Uh, 7,000 bar, something like that. And you'll often see this funny looking tail, and they think that's what's happened is inside you've broken the the grains or the 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 connections. They think you fractured the rock. It, in your definition, yes, but I would prefer to think that what you've done is you've broken the grain-to-grain -grain contacts or the cement interface. But what you just described, you would just take a lot of mercury with no increase in pressure, right. and then it would pick back up. Does that, do you usually, does that I've never seen possible? anything like that. Okay. I mean, I, I, I guess you could create a synthetic piece of rock, which you put some sort of a dissolvable bubble in, you know, because they use uh, Pyrex and other materials, centered metals and that sort of thing. Um, you know, that's a good question. I, I'm sure that's been experimented, but just sort of spitballing or, you know, talking with the hands, it's just going to, when it hits that, it's going to take a bunch of mercury. No, we're talking about the largest pore that's uh, accessible. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So tonight we talk about relative permeability, and again, we revisit our old friends Purcell and Burdeen, and they derived this back in the uh, late 40s, early 50s, and I think that's literally true. I think it was 48 to 52 or something like that. And then, um, actually, they did not have these terms. I think Wiley put these terms in it, but and all the references are in the notes, but... Um, the derivation of these goes along the same lines as we talked about with a bundle of tubes. The nice thing about this is this is the absolute permeability in the denominator and the effective permeability in the numerator. And what does that tell you? Well, that means all the other things factor out. All the other sort of non-essential or, you know, the parameters you might not know like uh, interfacial tension or those uh, fudge factors we talked about or even units factors. But... Again, 
this is a calculation and it does assume that there's a bundle of tubes that has a representation with a capillary pressure profile that could be used to calculate relative permeability. There are other methods. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. There are other methods besides Purcell and Burdeen. There are uh, these uh, lattice methods. A guy by the name of Fat F A T T did a whole bunch of work on lattice methods in the 50s, and it was essentially a parallel. Uh, concept to the work of bundle of tubes. As you know right now there's a lot of work being done with Boltzmann lattice um, configurations and sort of the same sort of thing. They, they would uh, be looking for some sort of configuration where you may not have all the, the tubes or the lattices filled at the same time uh, which would represent some sort of level of heterogeneity I guess. When we take the um, brooks corey capillary pressure equation which is power law and we insert it in here and we complete the integration and that is given in the notes that reduces to this and these equations are very straightforward they say that all you have to know is the intercept relative permeability to water the intercept non-wetting phase relative permeability and some saturation function with the lambda parameter so if I were sitting where you are, I'd say I don't ever have to run a relative permeability experiment. I can just use these equations. But where do you get the lambda value? Where's your start? Sorry? And I had so much hope for you. <laughs> history matching what? You're going to history match the production performance and you're going to estimate lambda from that. Okay, so you're going to let the data tell you what the model parameter should be. Yeah, that, that really makes me nervous, but I see your point. I, I, I literally do understand your message, and that is what he's saying, class, is that you'll match the performance data with a reservoir simulator by varying the lambda parameter and the uh, KR uh, W sub O or super O and the KR N super O, and that's how you would uh, estimate the relative permeability for a given. Uh, field performance and I, I guess because that's common practice I'm okay with it but I was really asking how would you estimate lambda not doing that <laughs> you would have to have a capillary pressure experiment okay a better question and this is the one where Mr. Leo is going to win is how do you estimate KR uh, W and KR N super zero that's going to be a history matching parameter or the uh, text by standing, which is included in the notes, explains how he correlated that with, uh, I believe, with irreducible saturation. So he actually ran or, or gathered a bunch of data uh, with endpoint relative permeability values and correlated it with uh, different properties. And I think it was porosity and saturation, if I remember correctly. So that would be another approach. We're really not supposed to be focused on this just yet. Okay, what affects relative permeability? This is now 67 years old, okay? And this is exactly as true today as it was 67 years ago. These guys did a very nice job. Chemical engineers, Mr. Ravi Kumar, Mr. Bake, where are you? Okay, so we turn the comments on, we draw a line, we turn the comments off, we drag our line over here. Our capillary pressure profile, if that capillary pressure profile is constant, we have a single tube, right? Everybody? And if we have a single tube, or as someone pointed out, I believe it was Mr. Bake, that it was a single fracture. Am I right? Was it you, Mr. Beck? Nope. Maybe. So we have a linear relationship for relative permeability. If we have uniform tubes. So what does this tell you, Gabe? 
let's say we're flowing water and oil in a single pipe, the proportional velocity of water and oil is going to be exactly proportional to the cross-sectional area of water and the cross-sectional area of oil, which in this labeling would be saturation, right? So that makes sense. What if we have a fracture class? Is it a big jump to go from a tube that looks like this to a very narrow slit that looks like this? No. This is why people think that fractures have linear relative permeabilities. Okay. Do they? We don't know. We don't know. Now, math ladies, what we're saying is theoretically, if we have a pure tube and a pure, very, very narrow slit, they would have the same kind of capillary pressure behavior, hence the same kind of relative permeability behavior. So the proportion of fluids flowing would be proportional to how much is there, which is saturation. All right, everybody ready? We're going to throw all that out the window. Now we're going to have a mix of tubes. And when we have a mix of tubes, we have to have a curve. So our capillary pressure curve probably looks more like this, like I'm going to draw it. But we'll be okay with that. Hey, is there anything happening in the world today? I was completely bombarded with uh, work and emails and that sort of thing today. Mostly emails with Mr. Ravi Kumar, because he can't seem to follow directions. That was your bad? Yeah, and you notice what time I returned your favor. Yeah. Um, anything happening? I don't know. What's going on in the world? Eric, you would know. You you never turn Fox News off. Hurricane or American? Uh, we already had our hurricane. Okay. So the capillary pressure profile starts out at some displacement pressure, has some curvature, and eventually it has to go like this. Now the way he's drawn it is that it goes to zero, but it can't go to zero because this little tiny thing right there is never going to completely unload, right? And there's probably another one over here, and then there's this one here, and this one here. And if they don't unload, it cannot go to zero, right? So it's probably something like that. I, okay, it should be further over, but everybody gets it. Okay. Uh, what is this point? I had to uh, visit an undergraduate class today for teaching, peer evaluation of teaching. You know, it's the kind of thing we do. I know it doesn't seem like it. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, mind if a faculty member came in here. They'd probably be afraid to, you know, but you guys get my abuse all the time and you probably love it. But I noticed that this faculty member was very deliberate and assumed that nobody knew anything as he was proceeding. But I'm going to assume, incorrectly of course, that you being graduate students, you can make inductive concepts. Okay. What does that mean, Cam? It means I'm going to ask you something you don't know, and you better think about it on the fly and figure it out. What does that crossover point mean? Miss Jen? No hobble English? Mr. Desai? I wish he had never learned my name. Anybody in the back? Ricardo, you thought you were going to hide back there, buddy. As a physicist, what does it mean? We talked about the GOK theorem, huh? Do you remember the GOK theorem? God only knows. Okay, we'll skip you. One. No, but what does that what does that cross point mean? You can say nothing. Mr. Aldana? It just happens to be the cross point, but I'm asking, does the location of the cross point mean anything? Oh, 
Okay, very good. Very good. I knew if I called on you, you would have an opinion. This is the one time you'll be right, sort of. What's the rule of thumb? Wrong. The rule of thumb is that it was not illegal for a man to beat his wife as long as the stick was less than the diameter of the thumb, right? That's a politically incorrect thing to say in class, but I saw it on TV the other night and <laughs> thought I would mention it because somebody said the rule of thumb is this, and the woman knocked him out <laughs> and said, there's your rule of thumb. So the conventional thought, we won't say rule of thumb ever again, is that if it's greater than 50%, then it's water wet. If it's less than 50%, then it's oil wet. What's the most important two-word question in the English language? Sorry? Exactly. So what? So what? Mr. Aldana? Okay, so you're saying that you it determines how you plan to model this or how you plan to interpret it. Does wettability really matter to the production and reservoir engineer? It matters to the petrophysicist because you're going to specify what kind of relative permeability or capillary pressure curve people can use, right? I, I, by the way, I got this completely wrong. I can't believe I did this. Oh, jeez. This is not the cross point between capillary pressure and relative permeability. It's the cross point between... Yeah, yeah, I know. Sorry. It's one of them days, guys. Here. I'll fix it. Mr. Aldana, what do you want it to be? Oil wet or water wet? Oil wet? <laughs> he thought I was an idiot. See, there you go. Man, I can't believe I did that. You guys got to remember to correct me when I'm wrong. Except for Mr. Ravi Kumar. You've already had your all your questions for the year. Okay, so if this were oil over here, man, I wish I could reset the default on this. I bet I can. Okay, so this would be KRO. Okay. Okay, it's got to be green. I get it. Jeez. What's your favorite color? Green. That's what I meant, sorry. So this crossover, ah! This is not my day. This crossover point. If it's less than 50%, then it's supposedly oil wet. And if it's greater than 50%, then supposedly it's water wet. Okay. Man, I feel like a complete idiot now. Okay. So the distributions of tubes, they govern both the capillary pressure and the relative permeability distributions. And again, this was 67 years ago. Unfortunately, um, I did not finish the lecture update, but I put all ALL of the uh, relative permeability and capillary pressure curves in there, and I was going to go through those with you. So you dodged a bullet. Okay, let me really quickly pretend like I'm teaching an undergraduate class. This is relative permeability to water. This scale would be relative permeability to oil. And this is capillary pressure over here. And this crossover point would be an indicator of wettability. Okay. Do you really believe in oil wet rocks? You do? You're a believer. Yesterday my graduate student told me that the problem with human beings is belief. 
Do you agree with that? No? Anybody else? Gabe? I told him the problem with human beings was selfishness. And he had to go think about that. But, but do you really believe this? What kind of rocks would be oil wet? Could sandstones be oil wet? Unlikely. Unlikely. Just say unlikely. Name a sandstone that's oil wet. That you believe are oil wet. How can a sandstone be oil wet? More affinity than water. These things were all deposited in water. And quartz is definitely water wet. Calcium carbonate is water wet. So how can a rock made up of that material be oil wet? Sorry? Must be coated like a paint. Okay. Is that likely or is it more likely what you're saying? That there just happens to be some oils that have some sort of affinity for this? Okay, heavy oil. So how long has that oil been in contact with that grain? Heavy oil reservoirs are usually unconsolidated as well, right? Okay. I'll give you that. I'll give you both that. Okay. But what kind of reservoirs are likely to be oil wet? Anybody? Sorry? Okay, where are we? All right. What kind of carbonate? Okay, very good. And why? I know you've seen it, so now you, you're, you're saying it. Most West Texas carbonates are thought to be intermediate wet, not fully oil wet. But it is because the oil was generated in nearby rocks that are in contact with the dolomites. And they believe that's why they're oil wet or intermediate wet. Okay. Are shales oil wet? Oh, I got your attention now. Is kerogen oil wet? It has to be. Why? Because it's what made the oil. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is a good, good little quiz, good little discussion. Does anybody have anything to add? And feel free to correct me if I've made a mistake. Hydrophobic. Yes. There are dolomites that are oil wet. There are shales that are thought to be oil wet, or at least intermediate wet. Intermediate wet. Now, Mr. Aldana, what would in intermediate wet mean in a practical standpoint, or what would oil wet mean in a practical standpoint? It's going to be very difficult to perform EOR, right? Very difficult. If the oil likes the rock, it doesn't want to leave. Okay. Now we've moved from discussions of capillary pressure to wettability. And we don't really talk about wettability a lot in this class, but if it likes something, it doesn't want to leave. Okay. These are some of uh, Gates and Templar Leeds' examples, and as I mentioned, I put a lot more in here. Air permeability is the non-wetting phase. Kerosene permeability is the wetting phase, and here's the capillary pressure curve. Now, when you see a capillary pressure curve that looks like this, what's the first thing that you think of? 
<laughs> that was a lot of talking. Somebody speak loudly. Sorry? Well sorted. And high permeability. Anybody else? What's a good color for air? Black. Now these are their generated curves. These are not drawn, these are calculated. What's a good color for oil class? The other day I saw somebody had a graph where all the colors were reversed. Yep. Nope, just somebody wasn't paying attention. Does color really matter? No, but if you're presenting to a bunch of people who don't want to be there, I think you probably don't want to confuse them with something like that. Okay. So again, the experimental points are given by the data points, and the uh, calculated curves are given by the integrals for which uh, we described earlier. They're variations of that. Okay. So these are high permeability samples. What's the permeability up there? 1370 millidarcies. Is that high? Yeah, that's real high. What's the other one? 585 millidarcies. You know, guys, I confess, I've probably looked at Darcy level reservoirs five times in my career. I probably looked at 100 millidarcy and above reservoirs, let's be generous, 50 times, 0 0.1, a few hundred. Once you start going down after that, the numbers skyrocket. I don't see things like this very often. And when I see this, I think easy, very predictable. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Now, they made two runs on this case. What happened? They made two experiments. Sorry? It's path. It, there is a hysteresis. Very good. Does it really matter? It's only a few percent. Buying or selling? Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, now our good friend Standing, he pops up again, and again, all of his notes are in the, the lecture notes. So this is frequency. These are Gaussian type distributions. So that's frequency and then pore radius size. He's drawn this distribution slightly skewed. Ah, come on. What's the message here? What's the message? Where's the water? Small est pores. I thought it would fill it in. How come it didn't fill it in? Oh well, who cares? All right, so the smallest pores are filled with water. The largest pores are filled with oil, obviously because water is a wetting phase. What if we reverse this, Mr. Aldana? If you said it was oil wet, then the oil will never come out of these small pores.
And I won't bore you with this, but the next one, there's water that cannot be moved. is here and they give it a fancy name called irreducible and then there's gas over here and obviously gas doesn't wet anything so we have irreducible water we have gas and then we have oil and then he's trying to explain that we have irreducible water we have gas and then we have mobile water this is water that can be moved and then again we have oil so I, I didn't really go into a lot of detail here, but I like the way Standing is trying to explain this and to basically give an idea of what you should expect. Water's always going to be in the smallest pores for water wet systems. Oil will always be in the larger pores. And gas, if it's there, will be in the largest pores, based completely on the ability to wet. Now let's talk really quickly about steady state and unsteady state relative permeability. Math ladies, steady state. You remember that? Okay. Let's ask the physicist. Physicist, steady state, what's his definition? Nothing changes with time. In a system like this, that means if a molecule goes in, then a molecule comes out, or vice versa. If a molecule comes out, then another one has to go in to replace it. Steady state also implies that the fluid nor the system are compressible. There's no storage of energy in the system. So steady state relative permeability, for our definition, is going to be we're going to have a pump, we're going to turn it on, and whatever goes in this end is going to come out the other end. Okay. Does steady state happen instantaneously? No, of course not. How would you define steady state? I started to say rule of thumb, but how would you define steady state? Okay. If I turn the pump on and I've got it set to two cc's per minute, what should I be watching to determine steady state? Pressure gauges. And when they stop changing, that's steady state. Okay. That works fine for single phase. But when I have two phase, it can take a long time. It can take an hour, even in a high permeability core, for you to achieve steady state. Okay. Well, people got in a hurry, and they didn't like that. So they wanted to have a faster experiment. So rather than turn the pumps on, both of them, and wait for equilibrium, they decided flood the core with oil and then do what? Turn the water pump on. And it pushes the oil out. Now unfortunately, until you produce water, you cannot use the unsteady state method. So it's going to be a while. What does a while mean? It's going to, there's going to be a gap in the saturation because you're going to be pushing things through. You're going to be pushing oil out and pushing water in, and you have no idea what the average saturation of that system is. More to the point, you cannot define that as an equilibrium point. So after breakthrough, as shown on the right-hand side diagram, then you just keep the water pump on and you keep measuring. Now... Here's a trick. Remember that piece of rock I gave you? You're pumping through it. How do you determine in 1950 what the saturation is? Sorry? You weigh it. You, weigh it. you have to stop the experiment, you have to take the core out, and you have to weigh it. That's what you're saying. What happens if you stop the experiment, take the core out, weigh it, put it back in, and start the experiment again? You've corrupted the experiment. Okay. What's another method? Okay, so you have to account for every drop of fluid that went in and came out. And if you keep track of that with time, then you in you know your you know the line volumes 
and everything else, you can determine how much was in the core at a given time. Okay? What's another method? This is still 1950. The resistivity, just like Archie, right? So if you've determined via another experiment what Archie's constant is, then you can have resistive, you can have conductive plates with a resistivity meter. And when this thing comes to equilibrium, then you take a resistivity reading and you can calculate the saturation. Okay? That all makes sense. What can you do today? You can do NMR, you can do CAT scan, okay? Anything else? The same thing as, of course, thank you. <laughs> I was like, is he saying you can do NMR and CAT scan? Okay, I get it, thank you. Could you also put the whole experiment on a, a scale? Mm, that'd be pretty tough. That'd be pretty tough. But that material balance idea you had, that's a pretty good one. And that weighing idea you had, that's a pretty good one. But you're going to have to be really careful. Okay? Really careful. All right, so let's pretend that we're doing the steady state experiment. The first thing we do is flood the core with 100% water. Why? What does that give us? That gives us the absolute permeability. K absolute. Okay. And then what do we do? We flood the core with oil until no more water is produced. And that gives us the endpoint effective permeability. Okay. And then we still have the oil pump on, but then we turn the water pump on. And we continue to monitor. And as you can see, you track how much water you produce how much oil you produce, and you can calculate the saturations. The oil pump's still on. The water rate is increased. A little more. The oil pump's still on. Water rate's increased even more. Still more. And then finally, you turn the oil pump off, and you flood until you produce no more oil. And when you do that, that is your effective permeability at residual oil saturation. Now, the reason I keep saying effective is because they haven't been divided by absolute, but we could do that. Any questions about this? Very straightforward. Mr. Aldana, your body language says you'd rather be up front explaining this. You're okay? You believe this? You could do this in your sleep. Have you run relative permeability experiments? Are they difficult? And they're a pain. Because anything goes wrong. The electricity goes out. The whatever. You get a leak, everything's a pain. So you would almost do anything besides run a relative permeability experiment. And how long is long? Days, weeks, months. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, probably the way we did it was we would incrementally reduce the oil until finally, you know, you're just doing a step. So maybe it's 80, 20, you know, and then you just 80, 20, then 60, 40, then uh, 40, 60, then 20, 80, and then off, that kind of thing. Depends on how many points you want. Yes? But every step that you reduce the pump, you wait for steady state to achieve it again. Right, and as he pointed out, it can take hours or weeks or whatever. It really depends on the rock and the oil. Okay. So, is it good to be in the business of? I'll come back. back. Is it good to be in the business of Core Lab? No. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. That's a great question, but we'll talk about that in a second. So, who in here wants to start a laboratory company? Actually, somebody just did. They bought up uh, ConocoPhillips old labs and some others and Premier Laboratories. But Core Lab, Weatherford, 
a few small companies like that, and then now this Premier is on the scene. So you'd start your own. So apparently they have a facility in Houston where there's just rooms and rooms and rooms of experiments. And then they have a completely other building devoted to Saudi Aramco. You know why? Because Saudi Aramco got tired of being in line. So they said, build another facility and we'll pay for it. And everybody's got stories, but this one is true. We had a project on the Clear Fork in the uh, mid-1990s, and we sent several dozen cores, preserved state cores, to Core Lab to have relative permeability experiments run. It took over a year. They were running ours, and Aramco came in and said, you know, we'll pay you X times as much to move to the top of the line. So, you know, if you want it bad enough, somebody will do it. So they ended up building a facility for them, or so I'm told. Okay, we had a question about boundary effects. We'll talk about that in just a second. Now, the unsteady state experiment is performed similarly to start. We go to 100% saturation. We get absolute permeability. And then we flood with oil, same thing. And we get our effective permeability at irreducible water. And then we turn on only water and wait, and wait, and wait. And this is before breakthrough. There's no water being produced right now. It's only oil. And then all of a sudden, at this moment, oil and water are produced. And at that point, you can calculate the saturations, and you can calculate the effective permeability, because now you know that you're producing water. And then you just keep on going with the water pump turned on, and you continue taking measurements. And last but not least, same step, you leave the water pump on, and you uh, produce to uh, the effective permeability of water at residual oil saturation. So this looks really simple. It's a nice schematic. But as Mr. Aldana pointed out, this can be weeks to months, Oops. and hopefully this is days to weeks, hopefully shorter. Okay. Now, let's talk about what Mr. Liu want to talk about. Richardson, Berner, Hafford, and Asaba. What year? 1951. I don't know what Richardson, Berner, or Curver, 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 Hafford did, but Asaba actually worked here. He, I had him for well logging class. He had been, a, he was a physicist, just like you, Ricardo. And he had been working on the radar lab at MIT. Of course, after the war ended, didn't have a job, so he went to work. I believe this was golf, but I may be wrong. Golf was bought by Texaco or Chevron. I think it was Texaco too, and then Chevron bought Texaco, of course. Um, so what happens is you're looking at a distribution at the outflow phase. That's zero distance, and you have these different measurements of saturation at each of those locations. So as you go to the interior of the core, you have these saturation profiles. And they've said this is a theoretical saturation gradient. I assume they came up with this by capillary pressure, but I'm not sure. What is the saturation by capillarity? What is the saturation at the outflow phase? What does the saturation have to be at the outflow phase? It has to be 100%. It has to be. What's the capillary pressure? Zero. Capillary pressure zero. The saturation has to be 100%. So his question is, how do you deal with this effect? I think that's what you're asking. So any ideas? How can you overcome that? 
What did they do here? Graph one, graph two, graph three, what's happening? They're increasing the rate. So in fact, this profile is saturation or sorry, is uh, rate dependent. Okay. But if you increase the rate enough, what happens? You overcome that boundary effect. You reduce it. You don't ever eliminate it. Because at the outflow phase, the capillary pressure is zero and saturation must be 100%. Think about it that way. If you're having trouble with this in any way, shape, or form, at the outflow phase, the capillary pressure is zero. There is no more medium. So what does the saturation have to be? It has to be 100%. All right. Now, take a deep breath. How would you fix this? Mr. Aldana? Zip. Don't say anything. Ladies? You want to take a shot? What's rule number zero in engineering? Cheat, right? So how do you cheat? How about if we put another piece of core there? We want to know the measurement inside of our core. But what if we put pieces of core on each end and we still make our measurements here? So that effect that he's talking about, that Mr. Liu is talking about, is in these sacrificial pieces, not in our piece. Now, what happens at the interface of those two cores? You still have a discontinuity. So what do they recommend? You use some sort of a pad or some sort of a medium. In fact, they use paper towels, but whatever it may be, in order to keep capillary continuity between them. But essentially what you're doing is you're pushing the saturation profile out into that. Those are called end pieces, and they're actually built into the connections. Okay. Next. In this case, we're looking at the effect of pressure drop, which is really flow rate. So this is a low pressure drop, higher pressure drop, highest pressure drop. And I know you have no idea what inches of water are, but this is how manometers used to be measured. So what's 80 inches? Probably about here. And then 200 inches would be 18 feet, something like that, 17 and a half feet. So that's pretty high. And then 350 inches is almost 30 feet. Okay. So that's the pressure imposed on these samples. And again, they are high permeability samples. It's Berea, so it's probably somewhere between 100 and 200 millidars. This could be higher. So is there an effective flow rate? Looking at the symbols, no. Are relative permeabilities rate dependent? Yes, no, or maybe. Remember we talked about beliefs. 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 What do we believe? We believe that they are not rate dependent, they are not viscosity dependent, they are not dependent upon the size of the sample. Correct? We believe those things. We've been taught those things. Step back. Are they rate dependent? There's a possibility. Especially if there are compositional effects in the fluid. But that's cheating. I'm talking about just simple fluids, oil and water. Are they rate dependent? They should not be. Are they viscosity dependent? Again, we're not talking about compositional fluids. We're talking about simple oil and water. They should not be. What about the size of the core? Okay. What does this tell us? What's 2.3 centimeters? Approximately an inch or a little bit less. 4.75 is a little bit less than 2. 7.23 is a little bit less than 3, right? So something like that, something like that, something like that. All right. Is there an effect? Here it says there is. Here it says there isn't. Now, very quickly, there's six different methods here. CAM, your old Penn State method, and then these other five. Okay, and then another group of methods, and another group of methods, and they're all performed on different size samples. This one's 114 milidarcies Berea, as I mentioned. This is approximately a little bit less than two inches. This is a little bit less than one inch. 
120 millet RC, and then our 7.23. So this is uh, different, slightly different samples, very similar permeabilities, different lengths, and different methods. Different methods. So they're actually different methods of determining relative permeability. So length effects are generally assumed to be minor. There are some, but they're assumed to be minor. Okay. Now let's talk about relative, uh, sorry, um, viscosity ratios. And I apologize. I looked and I looked and I looked and I looked and I looked in the literature, and this is all I could ever find. So if you can find another case where somebody's run viscosity ratio experiments, please tell me and it'll go in the notes. But according to the work that Keelan put into the core analysis book, there's no effect of viscosity, which makes sense. That's it. The rest is we did some, uh, we created a type curve for relative permeability, and that's here. And this one doesn't work out so well. It's not, it's, I know it's uh, whatever you want to call it, sexy looking, but it didn't work out so well. It was a really good idea. You know, the guy who did it, he should be famous, but unfortunately it didn't work out. And yes, it was me. So, um, at any rate, if you want to read through this, this is for your own reference. Okay? Questions to close? What are we going to do tomorrow night? Yes, sir. Right. Again, if you look at the equations, Darcy's law, and you create a ratio relationship, viscosity should not affect that, if you look at Darcy's law. I'm not arguing whether there's a possibility of something else going on. And I don't want to say this the way it's going to sound, but Darcy's law, the way you use it, or the way we use it, assumes what kind of fluids? Newtonian fluids. So if you start to talk about heavy oils or gas condensates or something else, there will be a non-Newtonian component of that. Okay, I'll end with a story. When I was your age, there was this guy named O'Day, and he stood about this tall. And he walked up to the microphone, and somebody from the UK had presented a paper on velocity-dependent relative permeability. And he had to move the microphone down, you know, <laughs> making noise and everything, and then turns it down, and he goes, every night, he was from Lebanon, I go to bed, and I pray to my God, that you are wrong. <laughs> and then he turned and he went and sat down. <laughs> and, <laughs> and also when I was your age, uh, I sat down in a meeting next to this old man and he was asleep. And whenever the speaker ended, I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, hey, you know, session's over. It was cats. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> I, had no, I was like, this guy's a god and he's asleep in the audience. <laughs> okay, that's enough for tonight. So tomorrow night we talk about electrical properties. And then next week you guys have math. Uh, it looks like you're going to have math all week. And then I'll come back and double up the following week to... Uh, uh, take care of the lecture. I could not get a return flight to College Station, uh, or sorry, could not get a return flight that would get me to College Station by class time, so my apologies. So you'll have math all next week with Alex, and then, uh, and please come, you know, I mean, that'd be respectful and nice. No, you paid for it, so you might as well, you know. uh, and we do feed you, so, um, what else? That's about it. Everybody doing well? Feeling good? Everybody healthy? No. Okay. Mentally or physically? Uh, both. Yes, Mr. Ravi Kumar. I am always available for your questions.
as long as you wear your Hello Kidney t-shirt. No, no, don't do that. I appreciate it. I'll have to show you my laptop case. It's not Hello Kidney, it's Hello Kitty. Oh. In all the terrible places I go in the world, they treat you a lot better whenever you put your Hello Kitty laptop case down. They know you're not a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your I question? I was wondering if, uh, you know, you talked about uh, the gas occupying the largest part of the carriage being all of it. Well, gas, when carriage and all no, gas not going to wet anything. I don't think so. That's a good question, but I, I, I think it would be relatively minor. Mr. Aldana, I don't, I don't see how. Liquids are always going to be more favorable. I mean, there, like I said, there was that Mavco paper on modeling fluid flow and kerogen, but I, just, I don't see how gas would ever be, uh, I don't know. I mean, you could probably twist the rel perms like Mr. Leo was saying, to make it do that, but I don't think I would. But it, just, it doesn't seem physically consistent. And again, we're jumping back to beliefs, which is a mistake. And again, the reason we cover all this is that whenever you're sitting in a meeting and somebody decides to invent, you know, new physics for how the stuff flows or how this or that happens, you don't have to humiliate them but at least you'll have some familiarity with talking to them afterwards and saying, you know, maybe this isn't right. You know, I was in a meeting recently where people thought maybe we should stop injecting sand again. And uh, I say again because we tried this in the late 80s and early 90s, and it seemed like a good idea because sand's expensive, but it turns out that it was not a very good idea. And I don't think we should do that. It's amazing how many ideas just sort of get regurgitated. And that's a fancy word for coming back. Okay, any other questions or comments? Mr. Bake, you doing well? You're in charge of the candy bucket. Make sure it makes it back to my possession. Uh, by the way, the case of charity can be well yes. You think so? If it's super critical, yeah. I, I would say that's true. But I don't think gas as gas, I don't think anything is going to be preferentially wet to gas in the presence of other liquids. I just can't fathom that, but I could be wrong. Would you say if gas is absorbed on the surface? Mm -hmm. of yeah, yeah. Earth? Of course, C chemically it can do that. Right. Okay. But that isn't the same thing as wetting. You know, this is why we need to continue this work on nanoscale behavior. What's the estimated volume of gas uh, fraction that can be uh, adsorbed onto shale? Anybody want to throw a number out? It's not 50%. Uh, more like 15 would be a maximum. And there's a lot of people that have come up with models that claim there's more than that, but you know, then you go back and you try to prove it, you just can't. Thanks for reminding me about supercritical fluids. That's a good idea. All right, everybody's happy? Mentally and physically? Man, that is a hell of a smile. I was missing a tooth yesterday. You didn't see it. What? Yeah, yesterday. Well, I have like many ears on my front teeth and one fell off yesterday, so that's why I was talking like yesterday. So why do you have missing tooth? No, but <laughs> why did I? Yes. Um, it just fell off. No violent story. No, no. I wish I had a cool side of the boss in my teeth. That is, that I is. Caught it with a wood. Well, see, like, I'm an engineer. I like to test the strength of it. I don't think that's a good idea. I thought maybe you're gonna say it was an old girlfriend kept it for a trophy or no. something. No, <laughs> not yet. That would be pretty cool. So I tell you, my aunt, who was more like her grandmother, she uh, died a couple of years ago. She was 101 years old. And the reason she died is she was just tired of living. You know. But everybody asked her, uh, well, my wife's grandmother died last year. She was 107. 
she was, I think she was the oldest living person in Dallas at the time, you know, and she just, there was nobody to talk to, you know, so, gotta go. Um, but my, uh, my aunt, pardon me, she had uh, several cases of Coca-Cola in her kitchen and would drink a six pack every day. Yeah. And everybody goes, what about her teeth? And I said, her teeth are fine. They're in a jar next to her bed. <laughs> she was a tough lady. And I'm sure you all have relatives that live uh, in a lot less pleasant ways than we do. Give them a call. Tell them you love them. My aunt had the last rotary phone in Texas, I think. She made them put a rotary phone back in her house. <laughs> Is that right? Okay, everybody, we'll see you tomorrow night. Thanks again. Uh, the CEE is tomorrow, the career enhancement event at the MSC. Yeah. No, no, but I'm saying try to go if you can. I know the likelihood of getting a job out of it is pretty small, but if you don't go, the likelihood is zero. And like I told the guys from Concho tonight, because there are tons of jobs in Midland, if you want one, you're going to have to go get it. It's not going to come to College Station and get you. So, end of lecture.